Part 2. The History of Dragon Warfare Origins There are many competing theories about the origin of dragons. Legends and history suggest that they once spread across much of the known world, a claim backed up by the discovery of dragon bones as far north as Ib and as south as the jungles of Sothios. Regardless of the confusion in our ancient texts, it is almost certain that the Valerians were the first to harness and subjugate these beasts as no one else could. This turning point in history occurred 5,000 years ago, when a sheep herding folk discovered dragons amidst the great volcanic islands known as the Fourteen Flames. Over time, with careful patience and the use of magic, the Valerians managed to tame these fierce creatures. Dominion over such powerful forces propelled the otherwise forgotten civilization into greatness. It also fundamentally changed the rules of war with the introduction of a new, terrifying and formidable weapon. The age of dragon warfare had arrived. History Almost from the very moment of their taming, the strength of dragons was exploited to attain power. This happened internally at first, within the Valerian government. On paper, Valeria was neither a kingdom nor an empire. Rather, it was referred to as a freehold, where all members, theoretically, had a say in the decision-making. In reality, however, it was the forty noble families who monopolized control of the dragons that were really calling the shots. These individuals became known as the Dragon Lords. Riding their deadly mounts into battle, they became the central force behind a new upstart military. Valerian expansion was at first limited to the peninsula along the Fourteen Flames. This initial conquest offered a training exercise in dragon warfare, where methods of equipping, riding and fighting with these new weapons of war were honed. It seems to have gone remarkably well, considering what would come next. News of what was happening in Valeria soon spread and caught the attention of the old empire of Geese. This thousand-year-old civilization was a formidable economic and military power which had conquered much of Essos with its famed lockstep legions. Violence between the two nations exploded into a series of five bloody wars. The previously dreaded legions found themselves unable to contend with dragons and were incapable of squashing the vastly outnumbered forces of the dragon lords. In the end, it would be their death sentence. The final Giscari War ended with the capital of Gis being stormed by Valerian troops and burned to the ground with dragon fire. What followed was a rapid expansion of the Valerian territory, similar to the period of Roman conquest and colonization following the Punic Wars. This insurmountable tide of aggression overwhelmed the Andals along the coast, who crossed the narrow sea into Westeros rather than fall captive. The powerful people of Rhoyne were among the last to resist. At the climax of the Rhoynar Wars, they raised a force of 250,000 men, the largest army Essos had ever seen. Using archers and water mages, they were able to take down several dragons and threatened to overrun Volantis. In response, the Valerians summoned the largest dragon fleet yet assembled. According to our records, more than 300 dragons descended with vengeful fury upon the armies of Rhoyne. Tens of thousands died, and the great harbour at Volantis turned red as far as the eye could see. Dragons had proved their unquestioned superiority over man. Yet now, at the height of their supreme power, the Valerians would face a threat greater than they had ever faced. The event would come to be known as the Doom. To this day, its causes are a mystery. Nonetheless, the consequences are unquestionable. A cataclysmic explosion tore apart the Valerian Peninsula, shattering it into smoldering fragments. The proudest city in the world, along with virtually all of the dragons of Issos, vanished in a day. However, a family of dragon lords had escaped the doom. They were the Targaryens, and had made their residence atop Dragonstone to the east of Westeros after receiving prophetic visions of the upcoming apocalypse. In their control were the only five known dragons to have survived the doom, along with a clutch of eggs. Unfortunately, four of the dragons died, 
leaving only Beleriand until two hatchlings, Vagar and Maraxis, were born. It is with these last remaining dragons that Aegon and his sisters, Visenya and Rhaenys, invaded Westeros. Despite the puny size of the invasion force, the Targaryens proved more than a match for the Seven Kingdoms. In the opening stages of the campaign, the three dragons functioned independently, adding firepower and flexibility to attacks being launched in multiple directions. At Gulltown, Visenya destroyed the Arryn fleet with Vagar. At Harrenhal, Aegon crushed the castle with Beleriand's flames. And at the last storm, Rhaenys defeated King Argilac's army with Meraxis. These three engagements testify to the strategic superiority of a dragon-armed force, which reigned supreme in three forms of combat – land battles, siege battles, and naval battles. Yet we should remember that such victories were won with a single dragon present on each occasion. When all three took the field together, their strength would prove crushing. This union of dragons would be required to defeat the largest host ever assembled in Westeros. A raid in defence against the Targaryens were 55,000 men, with 600 lords and over 5,000 knights. The battle that followed was the climax of Aegon's conquest. Here the fury of dragons was once again unleashed on the world. Beleriand, Vagar and Meraxes burned the enemy alive in a horrific slaughter that would be known as the Field of Fire. The swords of the defeated were forged into the Iron Throne and much of Westeros bent the knee in terror. Only Dawn remained defiant and unconquered. King Aegon, the first of his name, now took residence in the new capital at King's Landing, and founded the Targaryen dynasty that would last nearly three centuries. Its enduring success was almost entirely owed to dragons, whose strength and fear proved the bedrock of Targaryen rule. Yet, ultimately, it would be these same dragons that brought about its undoing. Their destructive power turned inwards in the ruinous Targaryen civil war known as the Dance of Dragons. This blood-drenched clash over the throne was fought between Rhaenyra and Aegon II from 129 to 131 AC. Ultimately, both leaders would be destroyed, as well as many of the participating dragons. At the eve of the conflict, 20 dragons were alive, but by its close, only four remained. The majority of these deaths resulted from duels between rivals in the skies above Westeros. These included the famous battle between Vagar and Arax above Shipbreaker's Bay, the battle between Vagar and Caraxes beneath the God's Eye, and the battle between Sunfire and Malaeus at the Rook's Roost. Lastly, many of the Targaryen dragons were slaughtered by rioters in the storming of the Dragon Pits. Though the Dance of the Dragons did not immediately bring about the downfall of the Targaryens, it undeniably contributed to their long-term decline. Dragons were now on the verge of extinction, and efforts to revive the population proved futile. The last dragon was a stunted, sick, and misshapen creature, which died at a young age in 153 AC. Soon, all that remained of the species were bones and fossilized eggs. Not long after the fall of dragons, the Targaryens also fell into decline, and eventually joined them in the ash heap of history. Hope of the world ever seeing another dragon faded. Yet, miraculously, Atop the funeral pyre of Khal Drogo, Daenerys Targaryen succeeded in hatching three of her dragon eggs. Thus, in 299 AC, 146 years after their presumed extinction, dragons had returned. Though still young, the three hatchlings, Drogon, Rhaegal, and Viserion, represent a new rising power of immense potential and herald the resurgence of magic into the world. Born fire incarnate, they stand as a counterbalance to the rise of the White Walkers. Up next, part 3 concludes the analysis of dragon warfare by directly analysing the tactics and counter-tactics that were employed historically. If you missed part 1, be sure to head back there to gain a proper understanding of the anatomy of these living weapon systems.